Warm welcome to our second panelist of the CNPS Yerba Buena Virtual Garden Tour, Matt Ritter. Matt is an author, editor, and professor of botany at California Polytechnic State University at San Luis Obispo. He was editor-in-chief of Madronio, the journal of the California Botanical Society for five years. As a scientific author, his publications include A California's Guide to the Trees Among Us and California Plants, A Guide to Our Iconic Flora. His natural history books reveal the wonders of California's unique flora. Matt, thanks so much for being with us here today. Well, I'm coming to you live from uh, my office here at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And uh, I have... I have, as far as I know, I have about a half hour to speak with you. So I'm going to share my screen and show you uh, some slides as I talk. Let me uh, start by thanking you all for having me. And Amber, that was awesome. I'm a, I'm a fan. I uh, my brother lives in Noe Valley, and so I've seen some of some of your work and some of the areas you talked about. I love it. Um, to get right into what I'm going to talk about, I'll just point out this slide and say this is the upper San Ynez River Valley. And I took this picture um, last spring when I stopped there uh, to uh, on the on Highway 154 over San Marcos Pass, walk along the road and get back and take take a photo because um, this is a I think it's a beautiful example of what uh, California represents so much for me, and that's that you have this clear sunny day, a brief green period in uh, in the spring. There's uh, oak woodlands there. You can see. Um, chaparral in the in the on the hillsides in the background you can actually see some chaparral in the foreground there's this this agricultural interface there's a riparian area native plants non-native plants all mixed together and uh, it would be impossible for us to do this but if you could count up the number of species in that uh, photograph it would be well it would be hundreds it could potentially be over a thousand species it's a huge amount of diversity in a in a small area which is true of a lot of places in California and I and I stopped there to take a photo of this specifically I wanted to capture this valley oak woodland uh, valley oak woodland this is a relatively rare thing and now in California the valley oak woodland here is on the deep uh, steep soil of the alluvial plain above the San Inez River and I love the valley oak. I grew up around them. Uh, it's one of the plants that I think is responsible for my interest in, in botany. They are majestic trees uh, known for this scaly bark, dark green, deeply lobed leaves. It's also one of the world's largest oak species. The world, uh, the world champion valley oak is actually in Covalo in Mendocino County. There's a photograph of it there. This is James Balog's famous composite photo of that tree. And uh, this is the second largest individual oak tree in the world, as it turns out. There's a larger one in Costa Rica, but a massive one. And, and, um, and I love this photo for its perspective, showing the tree from different different angles. And uh, I mean, you can also see, if you look at the base of that photo, you can see how large it, that tree actually is. You can see the two people sitting at the base of it. It's a, they, they get to be incredibly impressive trees. Um, Recently, Martin Crawford actually found an even a uh, tree with an even larger diameter outside Mariposa, California. And uh, the valley oak only occurs in California. It's in, uh, natively. It's endemic to California. It, it doesn't occur natively outside the boundaries of the state. They grow from about Shasta Lake in the north down to the San Fernando Valley. And it was well known to the Spaniards. The Spaniards called them Robles. Uh, the 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 town of Paso Robles was misnamed actually for this. Uh, Robles is a is the name for the the English oak, Quercus rober. And when they got to California, they saw this species and thought it was similar species or the same species. And when Spaniards arrived, these trees dotted California's fertile lowlands. We actually this is this is a a, a map of the current population, but we have no idea of the extent of the valley oak uh, in the earlier incursions into California. Willis Lynn Jepson, who was California's seminal botanist, he wrote in his 1923 book, the the trees of California, the valley oaks are recognized as the sign of the richest soil. And for that reason, valley oak uh, reproduction has suffered in California since the first European incursions 
because people uh, recognized that valley oaks occurred on places where good agricultural land was present, they had deep alluvial soil with high groundwater. And the lack of reproduction in the Valley Oak hasn't really improved over, over the last hundred years. Agriculture and grazing have created a situation where now what you see mostly when you see the Valley Oaks in California are relic trees. Uh, they, the, if you, if you want to see young trees, you have to go to places where, uh, and, and you, can, you can go between roads and the pastures next to the roads, uh, exclosures basically, where saplings can become established in the absence of grazing or competition from non-native grasses. Many valley oaks were removed for agriculture during the European settlements of California. And these are, um, these trees are massive and the 18th and early 19th century technology uh, for tree removal, it was, it was, they were difficult trees to remove. Here in the upper left-hand corner is a photo I found in the Atascadero Historical Society. Um, which shows a valley oak being removed with dynamite. And what you get in places where you see the valley oak now are mostly all entirely old individuals. There's a remnant stand on, on the, in the bottom photo on Fort Hunter Liggett. And these are only remnants of the vast tracks uh, on the alluvial fans of California lowland valleys that, that uh, once occurred. I'm a seventh generation Californian. Uh, I grew up in a remnant stand of Valley Oaks myself in, um, in Potter Valley, California, which is in Mendocino County. It's at the headwaters of the Russian River that runs down through Napa, Napa County and then out eventually into the Pacific and Jenner. And that arrow indicates where I spent the first 17 years in my life. And I, and then after, um, leaving there, I went to UC Santa Barbara, then UC San Diego, and then came here to San Luis Obispo, where I have had the uh, good fortune of being able to follow my interest in plants and botany. And I've been teaching students about, uh, well, about California plant diversity for the last 17 years now, uh, as a professor here in the biology department. And uh, one crucial motivation behind my teaching and the work that I do and the writings that I do is to help students and other and people and the general public identify California plants and identify them properly. This is, um, the, the, I find this to be a very important thing. And um, I um, often have to ask the question, but why help people identify things? Why do I do it? Why do I, I have a big interest in that? And I believe that the name of a plant is a passport that gives you access to its whole story. And knowing the names and stories of plants is, uh, is, is important. David Orr, who is chair of the Environmental Studies Department at Oberlin for many, many years, he says that the average person has come to recognize over a thousand corporate logos, but can now recognize fewer than 10 plants or animals native to his or her locality. Wow. And this is, this is a um, now been well documented in several peer reviewed publications about what is now being called plant blindness, which is just basically the inability to even see the organisms that so much of our society and our material wealth and our physical health depend on. Uh, the societal disconnect from the environment is a uh, it's a serious problem, and I I actually believe that this is why organizations like CNPS are so important and that they play this crucial role of connecting and continuing trying to connect people back to the, to native plants and to the native environment. Um, and this is why, you know, the, the, some of the proceeds of my books go to CNPS. I was vice president of the local chapter of CNPS for a long time. I believe it to be a, a really important organization and the disconnect from plants is a problem. It, uh, and, I think that telling the stories of the plants that we grow in our yards, talking to each other, getting the names right, using the, using the names, familiarizing other people with them uh, helps com combat the type of apathy that can lead to biodiversity loss and has lost, le led to biodiversity loss in California and Western North America. And I recently tried to tell the stories of California's iconic flora in uh, this book, which came out last year called California Plants. Um, and uh, I'm pretty proud of the book. I tell the story of the Valley Oak in the book. It's one of several hundred stories, uh, uh, natural history stories. And so what I thought I'd do is w w with you is share uh, uh, 
some stories of some of the iconic native plants, and some of which you all are already all might know and love and grow in your gardens. And uh, I, I picked some of my favorites to tell you about, but first I wanna just briefly go over in more global terms about the California flora in general, the species of plants that occur in the state and the, and the surrounding area, and so, and so that we can appreciate how diverse and special it is and how important conservation is. California is one of the world's 33 biodiversity hotspots, according to Conservation International. And these are regions that harbor a great deal of diversity, but at the same time, it, or, that is found nowhere else in the world, and at the same time being significantly impacted by humans and human activities. The western portion of California is, is one of the world's five Mediterranean uh, climate areas. These are areas with mild, wet winters and warm, dry summers. It turns out only 2% of the land area of the planet has a climate like we have here in western California. And plants, obviously, they don't recognize political boundaries. So the Mediterranean climate western portion of California, which is the actual biodiversity hotspot, usually goes under the name the California Floristic Province. And that's an estimation of the, uh, of the area of the California Floristic Province. It, it includes a little bit of Baja California, northwestern Baja California, southwestern Oregon, some areas around, around Tahoe, Nevada, in, in Nevada around Tahoe. And in this California floristic province, there are 6,000 uh, native species, give or take a couple hundred, and, and interestingly, 42% of them uh, are endemic. So that's nearly half of the flora in Western California, and that area occurs nowhere else in the world. And uh, since the time of the first European incursions into California and settlements here, three quarters of the original habitat has been lost. There are I think it was last April of 2019 that we ticked over the, or supposedly ticked over the population of 40 million people in California. So we have 40 million people in this, living in the state uh, or thereabouts, many, many more millions of people on their way. And at the same time, half of all the food that people eat in the United States is grown here in California. So we have these major agriculture and developmental impacts and yet it's still one of the most biodiverse places outside the tropics, so a particularly special place. And I say with conservation, the way California goes, so goes the world, because what, con what kind of conservation happens here is very difficult conservation involving a lot of uh, forces and, and, and people and a large population. The actual state itself, if you, uh, at the uh, since the, the publication of the last Jepson manual and the, and the e-flora shows that we have just over 5,000 native species within the boundaries of, of California. Uh, if you start to add varieties and subspecies and so on, you get over 6,500. It's interesting that all that diversity is not evenly distributed uh, throughout California. This is a paper, a, a recent paper from Bruce Baldwin and his colleagues at UC Berkeley, which showed species richness and endemism in California is unevenly dis distributed. And the air, these are 10 uh, by 10 square kilometer areas. And you can see that right around the Bay Area, there's a huge amount of diversity, I even in a small area. So even Bay Area is even a biodiversity hotspot within a biodiversity hotspot. Other interesting things about our flora is that a third of all the species in California uh, occur in only five plant families. That's the sunflowers and the legumes. Uh, members of the Baraginaceae, like uh, Phacelia and Amsinchia and so on. We have a ton of native grasses here, and then members of the Brassicaceae. Um, other interesting thing about California is a third of all the species in California are, are annuals. They grow and die in a single, single season. They come up in, in uh, late winter, early spring, flower in late spring, early summer, and then dry down to a seed every year. Um, Nothing exemplifies the seasonality of our flora like vernal pools. Vernal, this is one here at Fort Ord and down near Monterey. Uh, vernal pools are these seasonal wetlands that form in the shallow depressions. Usually they're underlain by some kind of impervious soil that retains a little more winter rainfall. And the short wet, wet season in California leads to this special and now rare habitat. 
the there are some pictures of the Jepson Prairie Preserve in Solano County. As the water levels subside around these pools, you get different species flowering sequentially, forming rings of color along the pool's margins. And these are special habitats. They're really great when you get to see them in, in bloom and see these rings of bloom in them. This is a vernal pool in eastern San Luis Obispo County that I visit pretty frequently. Uh, here, I saw this pool just recently, uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, this is what teaching botany, which I'm doing now, teaching, I'm teaching field botany as we speak. Um, this is what it looks like in, in the time of COVID-19, me there by myself, um, looking at tiny plants and making observations on iNaturalist for students. It used to look like this when we could all be together and we will be again, um, and these vernal pools, they don't only exemplify seasonality for California. There's a rare plants in there and there's rare plants in this vernal pool. Um, as, uh, as much as 90% of the vernal pools themselves present in pre-Columbian times in California are now gone. California vernal pools are now full of rare plants and animals. The state itself is full of rare plants. 37% of the species in California are rare in one, uh, in one, way, or another, in one way or another. We have 284 species um, are officially state or federally listed as rare and endangered in, 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 the, uh, in, in the state. And um, the two examples I give you right there are the, the purple amole, which is, it occurs right near that vernal pool that I showed you, and then our local San Luis Obispo calicordis, the San Luis Obispo mariposa lily, a really spectacular serpentine endemic. At the same time, California is also a spectacular state for large plants. Uh, it's a special place worldwide for our trees. We have the most massive, tallest, oldest trees, the largest oaks, uh, tallest, largest pines, other champion trees. Uh, we have three of the four verified oldest species in the world occur here in, in California. That's the bristlecone pine, the giant sequoia, our western juniper. Here's a friend of mine, Tim Forsell in the White Mountains, which, which with what we think is the largest bristlecone pine. Um, it's it's um, not the oldest. It's, it's a youngster, actually. It's about 1,800, estimated to be about eight, only 1,800 years old four times, three or three or four times younger than the, some of the oldest ones that occur right in that same area. Uh, there are six species in the world that are capable of a height of over 300 feet. And we have four of those six here in California. Our giant sequoia, the Sitka spruce, there's a eucalyptus in Tasmania that is, can, can be over 300. There's a, we have Coast Douglas firs here uh, in, in California. The largest one though is in Oregon. There's the yellow Maranti, a recently discovered uh, uh, new tall tree in Borneo, second tallest species in the world. And then our official California state tree, the, the coast redwood, is, the, is currently the world's tallest species at, at heights of near, near or over 380 feet. Um, the coast redwood is... Um, one of my favorite plants of all times. I think the forests that they occur in, the remaining forests are unequaled worldwide. They've been hammered over the last 150 years in California. It's a wonderful material, one of the world's best woods, and uh, people have known that for many years, and unfortunately this species has been impacted because of uh, its economic value. Starting in about 1850, there was a bonanza of logging that took place in Northern California the areas right around where I grew up. These huge trees use, yielded this huge amount of wood and uh, with the technology of the 1800s, it was difficult for people to log these massive trees. Logging a single tree often took a lot of time. Uh, people made fortunes. That's William Carson there, uh, standing next to a board that says 27012. That's two inches wide, 70 inches, two inches thick, 70 inches wide, and 12 feet long. Not a single knot in the whole thing. Type of material that just doesn't exist anymore. He invented the... Um, steam donkey engine, which is, was basically a steam powered winch that allowed uh, logs to be pulled out of the forest, which is why he uh, made so much money in logging. Technology obviously increased and entire infrastructures were set up in Mendocino County and, uh, and north of there. 
throughout Northern California to move large trees out of the forest to the lumber mills and then eventually to San Francisco. San Francisco was built twice, basically, with redwood before and after the, the, the earthquake and fire of 1906. In the early 20th century, what redwood became so popular that it was started to be used in everything. And all that logging turned what people thought was an inexhaustible resource into a rarity. And uh, when I say that they thought it was an inexhaustible resource, they actually did. If you go back and read the original writings of some of the loggers, which I have done a lot of, and I've had a lot of conversations with Jared Farmer, a friend of mine who wrote a book called Trees in Paradise, The History of California, looking at the redwood, they actually believed that they weren't going to be able to impact the forest. They weren't, that, that, that the trees took so long to cut down, they were so big, and there was so much wood available that that original 2 million acres, which uh, was on, you couldn't impact it. The Virgin Coast Redwood Forest originally covered 2 million acres in California in this fog belt Mediterranean climate portion of California from Southern Monterey County, just the border of San Luis Obispo County, just to over the border in Oregon. And that original 2 million acres of old growth forest, which is shown here in green, that forest was logged down to 120,000 acres of preserved land in just um, just over about 120 years. That's 96% of all um, old growth forests were logged during that time, a little over 96% actually. And I, I, I think, you know, thank goodness somebody was paying attention at the time that even at the turn of the last century, say the Redwoods League purchased the first groves for preservation and they lobbied Congress to protect what was left things exactly like what CNPS is doing now with, with conservation and preservation of different areas in California uh, was happening even back then. And, uh, you know, you, you got to think about what future humans are going to look back on at this time and say, I can't believe they thought that was inexhaustible. What, what, what can we do to pace ourselves? And um, those are all conversations, obviously, we should be having. One of the protected stands is the Rockefeller Grove. Here's a picture of my previous graduate student, Natalie Rossington, walking in the, the, the grove there. It, this grove was saved, and it has the distinction now of being uh, a grove with the largest, uh, the most above-ground biomass of any other um, place in the world. It's also, also the largest remaining contiguous old-growth forest of coast redwoods. It's a truly impressive place. And you, if you think of, we lost 96% of these and um, this is what we have left. And this, the, the small amount we have left is incredibly impressive. And it just goes to show how important conservation was back then, how important modern day conservation is now. And I started with this photo of the San Ynez River and by saying that there could be hundreds and hundreds of species in this photo and that their identification, the names, their stories are all important. And our relationships to these plants, they can be increased by growing them and growing them in our yards and our public spaces and growing them around us. And um, we can grow native plants for conservation and we can grow them for pollinators and other wildlife that depend on them. Uh, it's important to maintain. Also, I think a really important thing is to maintain a sense of place, uh, a California aesthetic, a, uh, a stewardship of our local floras and what we care about. And we can do that in, in, uh, and by bringing these plants into our yards. And, um, if you're looking to grow native plants in your area, you know, I recommend you talk to somebody like Amber who, who knows a lot about and has a lot of experience with growing natives or members of the local chapter of CNPS. Cal Flores, planting uh, guide is also is also great it, um you can get information about the natives that grow in your area you can uh, they separate it out by plant habit it's like trees and shrubs and wildflowers and so on for instance for trees i just put in central center of san francisco and, and there's uh, they say arbutus menziesii the the madrone or the buckeye and so on and and, and the coast live oak as well Obviously, the Coast Live Oak is native to uh, to San Francisco. It's native to from Sonoma all the way down into to Baja California, endemic to the California floristic province, though, and and is what people call the most urban tree in the world in the sense that in its native range, there are about thirty five million people living in its native range. 
And Grown, the coastal live oak, like Amber said, is a great idea if you have the space to do so. There are other smaller California native oaks that uh, that I really love that I think that um, people should consider. They're not necessarily way smaller, but um, one, I, one I'm, I'm very interested in lately is the island oak, Quercus tomentella, which is, occurs out on Santa Barbara Ch Channel Islands. It's the it is a uh, it's a great tree. Another rare tr rare oak is the Engelman oak, and people are now trying trying this and trying to grow it all over uh, California. Engelman oak occurs natively only in the Peninsular Range, from basically Pasadena down into to eastern San Diego. And of the twenty one species of oak that we have native to California, this is one of the rarer ones. Uh, another great plant. And Amber talked about this as well. Is that uh, is the is the Asculus californica? It's the only member of the genus Asculus in California. In California, uh, and it's a it's they're in bloom right now in San Luis Obispo. I don't know if they're in bloom up by by you guys in San Francisco, but man, they smell wonderful. It's a it's a um, an under described wonderful aspect of the California Buckeye is that first of all, it's drought deciduous. It's not so much deciduous like you would expect from a tree on the East Coast where it goes deciduous during the winter and cold time. Uh, it, it, it has leaves on it during the spring and it goes deciduous in summer basically and will stay deciduous for a long period of time. But the form of the tree and its deciduous um, time and the ability to grow all kinds of other native plants underneath it is a real cool aspect of, uh, of the California buckeye. Uh, we have 58 species of manzanitas in California. It's a primarily California genus, and there are a number of species native to the Bay Area, great ones. Here um, is bigberry manzanita. Uh, we have a local one that I like a lot called the Santa Lucia manzanita, and, um, but there are, there are many in your region. You should, you, you should be trying these. Ceanothus as well uh, is another uh, primarily California genus. We have 55 species of Ceanothus, and this is Ceanothus cuneatus, which does occur in the Bay Area. This here, it's blooming in the Santa Monica Mountains, and they're variously called Ceanothus or California lilacs, and um, they're, they're, they're great in fruit, some beautiful fruit colored ones, all, uh, and, and flower color ranging from bright white all the way to, a, to a deep purple. And then again, some interesting bark, and, and like the one in the bottom right hand corner there, which is the white bark Ceanothus, Ceanothus leucodermis. Another plant that I like a lot, also native to your, your area and mine, as it turns out, is um, the red bud. It's another uh, genus with, uh, with one species uh, in the genus in California, Circus occidentalis, a uh, deciduous legume that is uh, unrelated to, to many other legumes in the world. It's got a strange and, and um, coliferous meaning it blooms right out of the bark uh, of its pink, really nice uh, leguminous flowers. Also, uh, the buckwheats, and Amber mentioned a number of them. It's the largest genus, dicot genus in California. We have 250 native to California, and they're shrubs. About half the genus actually is annuals and, and can be grown from seed. Um, some of my favorites are, are endemic to the Santa Cruz Island, Santa Cruz Island buckwheat, but there are a number of native species that are throughout the Bay Area, all, which are also also great. Uh, lupins are another really truly California, uh, especially shrub lupin, lupins. California, as it turns out, it's one of the bio, uh, the centers of biodiversity for the genus, and we have uh, we have a bunch of shrubs, um, but also. Uh, annuals in the genus lupin, the lupinus albifrons is shown there, yellow tree lupin, lupinus arboreus. And if you have hot, dry area, obviously there's all kinds of other options in California. Woolly blue corals is one I really particularly like. Trichostanum and linatum is a great smelling, beautiful flowered uh, member of, of the mint family that grows uh, in hot, dry chaparral areas. During the question and answer session, somebody was talking about container plant growing and uh, California fuchsia is, is an option for that. It's a, uh, it's a great plant. It grows in the ground as well. I have it all over my yard. I love this, uh, I love this plant. Epilobium camum used to be in the genus Sauchneria. And then um, the, the, if you want to try some really cool container plants, 
tend to not grow them in, in the ground, but I can grow them in containers is uh, members of the genus Lilium in California. We have a number of leopard lilies native to California and you can occasionally uh, purchase bulbs and they make these really impressive and, and, and nice flowers. Uh, also, there was talk of Dudleyas. Dudleyas are rock plants that are in the, in the Crassula family. And we have a ton of species in California that are, uh, are, are spectacular succulents and actually can grow, be grown in real small containers. And, um, and they can be grown in big containers too because there are species that, are, that vary in size, very greatly in size. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we've had uh, succulents and dudley a poaching in california uh one way to, to i think to push back against this kind of thing is growing more of them from seed getting them more into the horticulture trade making them less value valuable to collect out of the wild part of conservation is growing things and growing things in our yards and uh and it's important for us to be growing them for ecosystem services also for a sense of beauty in a place and to talk about their stories to identify them correctly. That's, uh, again, identity of plants is really important to me. So, uh, you know, the book contains uh, uh, plant identification, um, wildflower guides, as well as um, a, a tree identification flow chart. Each iconic species is treated with beautiful photographs, new range maps that I made for everything. Uh, and it all appears in the context of the habitats in which the species occurs. Uh, we have so many of these incredible native plants here in California. We have ephemeral species, we have our rare species, world's most grand trees, and the, all this incredible beauty and options for your garden. We have a great plant palette, and, uh, and that plant palette should be moved more and more and more into public spaces. And the idea of the book is to celebrate what we have so we can con continue to conserve it for generations. So with that, I'll say thank you for listening. And I guess um, I can take questions or I can whatever, whatever you want to do. Yeah, Matt, I have a question. Um, I was answering the chat and may have, did you talk about scrub oak at all? Orcus berberifolia. Berberitifolia. Like leaves like berberis is where that name comes from. Um, yeah, so I said there was 21 species of native oaks in California. Half of those mature as, uh, as just shrubs. And uh, so, so we have about 10 species of shrubby oaks. Uh, Aquarius dorata is a great example of one, the leather oak that occurs almost uh, entirely on serpentine. Uh, and it, it's, it's, you know, it's mature height is somewhere around like my chest, uh, four or five feet, something like that. And um, they are, they're, they're an awesome option. They're slow growing. They're difficult to grow many of them. But if you can get a good shrub oak to grow, it's a really impressive and, and cool specimen plant in most situations. And, and equivalent to, to manzanitas or cianothus, they're, they're shrubs that occur mostly in chaparral settings in California. And berberitifolia would be um, the most widely dispersed of the 10 uh, shrubby oaks. So thanks for that question, Bob. All right, well, Matt, thanks so much, man. This has been fantastic. There's more questions in case you uh, uh, don't mind sticking around and uh, going to the uh, chat box or the, in the I'll, Q&A. I'll, I'll type some questions, yeah, no problem, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. And, Hope to see you again soon.